played a huge role in the big collision in uh, Korea events. Um, this is kind of, uh, everyone talks about uh, the collision in Korea events when they're talking about the history of WCW. So I'm wondering if you could go into the whole detail of, of how they were set up and what it was like there and the various issues that happened with some of the wrestlers and other talent. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, you know, we can go, there's, there's Four yeah, hours. <laughs> yeah, there's a four hours movie on that deal. First of all, um, Antonio Inoki uh, had reached out to Brad Riggins and Eric Bischoff because uh, uh, to work a. Um, by the way, Antonio Inoki was a member of a diet. He was like a senator over there in Japan at the time, and uh, a pretty big politician. Um, he uh, uh, reached out to Eric to get in contact with Muhammad Ali. And, and this was certainly before I was on, on front of camera talent. Uh, so uh, Eric made that happen. Uh, I think in Denver, we, uh, we had a photo. Matter of fact, I have a photograph here somewhere. <clears throat> I had a picture with Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki and and um, you know Muhammad Ali is one of my heroes you know with all the stuff he went through um, and and uh, um, so I got to meet him um, Eric put this deal together and throughout that Antonio Inoki was, was working on this peace festival and having this event in North Korea now let me tell you how that kind of comes about with Japanese pro wrestling. And you got to kind of go back in history. May, the, the, one of the most fo famous wrestlers in Japan in professional wrestling history is Liki Dozan, who was Korean born, who changed his name to in Japanese and became one of the father of professional wrestling in Japan. So here's Ricky Dosan, Giant Baba, Antonio Inoki, and these people come underneath that, you know, that family tree per se, or pro wrestling tree in Japan. And so with Ricky Dosan being born in North Korea, um, and Antonio Inoki being professional um, wrestler slash member of a diet, was trying to create this uh, uh, peace festival to bring professional wrestling to North Korea. Mind you, this is way before, right? Um, um, you know, Rodman and, you know, but another gentleman that I got to know through wrestling. Um, so, as, as this Muhammad Ali meeting happens and Antonio Inoki mentions, you know, we're doing this peace festival, maybe you can join us to North Korea. And and so originally it was New Japan Pro Wrestling guys going to North Korea for this peace festival. And because some of the talent and because we had the talent exchange program, um, people that who um, you know who was working for New Japan at the time, the Steiners um, and and Rory Hawk and those guys well, was going to go to that show, I got invited, and and Eric Bischoff and I got invited. Uh, um, um, Akita Hokuto was there, and and Eric says, well, we're going to, do you want to go to North Korea? Yeah, i never been there. And, you know, knowing that it's, it's, it's kind of a forbidden place to go, certainly as a U.S. citizen and, and certainly as a Japanese citizen, and I got a few calls from the government official telling me that he says, hey, we don't want you to go. If you go, we can't guarantee your safety, you know. But, you know, in 86, I was in South Africa when there was still apartheid, and they told me the same thing back then. So, yeah, we go. So, I mean, we, you know, whether it was, was uh, young and foolish, or well, I wasn't that young, but, you know, it was an experience that we were certainly not going to get another chance. So we went and, and um, 
it was it was it was a quite the trip. And I can go on and on about that experience. Um, we got on a plane, and I'll, I'll do a small, short version of this. So we got on a plane in in, in Nagoya, uh, and it was a North Korean plane, and it was one of those DC nine, looked like a fixed fixed wing plane. You know what I'm talking about? And and I was fortunate enough to sit up front, which is considered, I'm sure, it was a first class. But mind you, we're talking about North Korea, North Korean plane, <laughs> and and I remember flight took a while, but I remember. Um, the flight attendant came by and said something that we couldn't really understand. And it was really, you got to understand the contrast. We're flying first class and Japan airline on, you know, 747 from United States to Japan. And then we get on this DC-10, <laughs> you know. And I remember planes start to rub up and we're going to take off. And I guess all of us used to put on a seatbelt. <laughs> some of the planes, some of the seat didn't have a seatbelt, so it was kind of that. That's one of the things I remember. <laughs> now we interviewed Scorpio, and he told us that he got into a fight with Hawk. I, I was there and, too. <laughs> can you tell us your version? Of that? Well, you know, we're kind of cooped up in the country, right? First of all, everybody's you know, especially the American boys, all freaking out because we're flying in and we see the skyscrapers. And, you know, they're actually flying us around the capital, so we all see it, right? You know, a lot of things was, you know, propaganda. You know, they, they want us to see a lot of things that, you know, they, they want us to see what they want to show us. And there was, you know, there was famine going on to North Korea at the time. Um, so we're flying to the city, and there's like an eight-lane highway coming out of the city, right? And we're flying and we see like clay, like n not a lot of green, you know. And we see the highway in the middle of the day, but we don't see any cars. I'm going, like, wow, you know. So that's kind of first impression. We, we, we fly in. First thing they do is they take our passport. So you can imagine all the boys are coming up to me because I was kind of Japanese, you know, their liaison for a foreign trip. And, you know, they're all going like, where's, you know, I need my passport. And I, I remember Ric Flair just freaking out, you know. And, and basically, you know, my answer was, yeah, they took my passport too. But even if he had your passport, where are you going? We got communist China to the north. We have DMZ to the south. There's no way out of here unless they let us out. So, you know, like what they told us, a New Japan official told us, you know, before we left, you know, you got to be at your best behavior. And and apparently Scott Norton forgot about that, that memo that he got for that one. Because I'll tell you that incident in a minute here. But um, uh, so getting in and up to answer your question about Scorpio and, you know, and and Hawk, you know Hawk, you know a little hot head anyway. So we we talked about him and Randy, and and so somehow he was, you know, he didn't miss any words, and and you know, I, and I I, I, I kind of got idea uh, because I don't know for sure. I don't want to mention it, but you know why they had a heat between them, and but anyway, you know, being both being athletes and both being pretty buffed, and and they're pretty tough guys, and. And, you know, word got a little heated, and did they get into it in a bus? You know, there was a port apart, and I do remember that. But not knowing what, you know, what all the detail was. But I remember Eric telling those guys, says, listen, we're in North Korea. You know, only way we can get out of here is that <laughs> they let us out. And, and uh, so... Uh, um, uh, to give you an idea about Scott Norton, Scott Norton wanted to call home. I, I obviously wanted to call his wife, actually. And, but um, and the only way you can make a phone call out of North Korea, and they told us, right? I and mean, they told us that everything you do once we land, somebody's watching you. They're listening to you. So be at your best behavior, you know. And, and mind you, they're giving us their best 
that they have to offer. But their best they have to offer is, you know, nothing like you used to in Japan or in certainly in the United States, you know. And uh, um, food, I, 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 you know, foods are, you know, at best, and they're giving us their best. But, you know, we're not getting, there's a famine going on. There's, you know, we're not getting, you know, prime ribs here, you know. And Didn't Scott Steiner throw a piece of food across a room or something? At one no, point? what happened was they had this big Korean barbecue thing going on in a park. It's a beautiful park and, 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 uh, and it, you know, the, the food that they was cooking was a stringy, you know, something that resembled meat, you know, looked like a little gristle thing. And, <laughs> And I, you know, and, and I don't know if it was Scott. I think it was Scott. I'm not sure. But, you know, we're outdoors and there's people walking around smelling the barbecue. You know, whether it's a gristle or what, it still smells good, right? Especially if you haven't had a meat for probably a couple of years. And I think he kind of tossed one of the meat because he didn't like it. And, and, and I think it was his brother that said, hey. That's probably not very good. These people haven't had a food. I think kind of smartened him up on that. And what happened to um, um, Scott, Scott Norton. Norton was that he, he wanted to call home. So in order for you to make a phone call, you get on and they call the operator. And the operator calls China. You give them the number in China because that's the only people they had a connection with. And they will call you back. They will ring you back. And, you know, it's like going back in time so um, Scott gets on the phone in his hotel room and started you know forgot that there was people listening and I think he was talking to his dad or maybe it was his wife Tammy but anyway um, complaining about the food and uh, passport and you know what a sh shitty place this you know, North Korea was. And from what Scott told me was phone went dead. And a few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. And we all were assigned a translator. But they weren't really translators, right? They were like Secret Service people, you know. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think there was a couple guys behind them. Uh, I think they were armed, and and they kind of asked. They were asked him, so why do you dislike a country so much, <laughs> or something to that word? Scott can tell you uh, when you interview him. But I think his room was never cleaned after that. I did let him know that they didn't like what he said, and you know, knowing that what happened to some of the people. In North Korea, after we've been there, uh, you know, the kid that stole the poster and all that stuff, who ended up dying. Um, I think Scott was lucky to get home. <laughs> and I read in Ric Flair's book that he seemed to indicate that a lot of the fans were almost forced to come watch. Well, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. And, and, and all I know is that, is that there was two television channels in our hotel room. One was all propaganda of Kim Sung Il, which was, was uh, Kim Sung Un's dad at the time. Um, propaganda about how North Korea has defeated, you know, Japanese in World War II and, and, and uh, United States and Korean conflict. And I mean, their history is a little different than ours, obviously. And then you had another channel that was nothing about professional wrestling. <laughs> Oh, really? Let me tell you how big the whole thing was. The money, the one we exchanged our money, had Antonio Inoki and professional wrestler on it. They printed money just for us, for that, that whole country had to use our money. And I asked why that was, and they didn't really give me a straight answer from the North Korean representative. But if you really think about it, it was so that they can control our dollar. So when we exchanged it, we didn't exchange it with their current currency, but with this new 
currency just made for us. So they can make sure that the dollar that we gave to that country makes sure you ended up in the government's hand. I see. So it was, you know, that's how big the whole thing was. I mean, it was, it, and 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 uh, um, if you saw the video of collision in Korea, you saw that uh, in the stadium where we performed, there was there was picture of these flip cards yeah. of these missile flying. You know, it's like a pixel, right? Each one of these little kid had a pixel of television, if you can imagine. Uh, on your television, each pixel with these little kids flipping these cards. So it, the missile would fly off and, you know, destroy, you know, building in America and that kind of thing, you know. And it, uh, if you see the video, you'll see it. Um, they told me they practiced for six months just for our event. So you can imagine how big this thing was, right? Um, and to to answer your question about what, what it said in Ric Flair's book, I know they didn't pay for the ticket, likely. Um, do they have to be there? Mm, they were probably invited to be there, and the way the country works is they probably better show up kind of thing. Um, so yeah, Rick is probably right to a certain degree, but you know, you gotta understand, you, you, if you're North Korean, you're just trying to survive, right? And, and the government plays a big part of your life. And, you know, you're actually going to get a holiday to go watch wrestling for two days. You know, would you want to be working? Or would you want to be able to go sit and watch something that you haven't, you, you know, you don't get an opportunity to see? So, you know, I, 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 there was some what Ric Flair says true, but I'm sure there was, you know, these guys, it was, they probably don't then sell that event as entertainment. It was more of, you know, um, uh, competition between um, great evil American versus you know Asian guys who represented from New Japan who, who you know who uh, Korean people I'm, I'm sure identify with so Antonio Inoki who had a great relationship with uh, North Korean government um, physically competing against you know what represents all the things wrong with the United States, you know, Ric Flair and his gown and his entrance and blonde hair and, and you know, you know, uh, 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 um, grand disc of Ric Flair. It was, it, I'm sure it was a great, you know, show. And of course, Antonio Inoki goes over on that match and, you know, uh, but it, uh, uh, Ric Flair was graceful in his defeat. You know, and 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 um, it was it was a great happy ending for certainly for the audience. You know, it was a great payoff, and so. Uh, was it originally supposed to be Hogan, and Hogan didn't want to go, so they sent? Flair. Yeah, I guess so. But you know, but um, you know, certainly there was no n nothing lost by you know Ric Flair being there, and I don't know if Rick wanted to be there. <laughs> According to his book, no. probably not, right? He also mentioned that uh, Muhammad Ali was getting a little testy towards the end there, and he actually started talking normally at a few points, and he was worried about getting. Well, I'll, I'll tell you funny, and I'll show you a picture uh, a little bit later. Um, um, so we went to visit, you know, they take us to these, you know, propaganda visits, right? You know, cameras. And by the way, you know, you have this great camera and, and lighting here. Eric Bischoff and I was together most of the time, and we had this um, uh, lady secret service slash translator that was assigned to us. And we would go to these various events. They have, they have a, uh, uh, um, you know, the Gate of Triumph in, in, in France, yeah. in, in, in Paris. They have their version of that there. But it's the, 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 the carving and monuments on the wall is North Korean citizen defeating, you know, the evil American and, you know, in, in Japanese. <laughs> you know, having to be, we're two of their greatest enemies. And, and they would ask us, was that in the background? They would stick a mic in my face. And, but their camera is guys literally doing this. And the lights that we have here are nothing like these lights. They're actually light bulb. 
with the battery pack on a guy because technology hasn't gotten there and mind, mind you this is many years ago as well so the guy's battery packs are like a, a Batman's utility packs <laughs> and one camera guy actually rolling the film nice. and that's 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 that was the technology that's in the 96 or so or <laughs> right, yeah or? but we're, we're still in 1954 technology yeah. right and and they would ask us questions you know they would kind of bait us right and, and the question to me was, since they knew I was from Japanese uh, um, born, so they would, say, they would ask me like, um, so, so Sonny, don't you think that Japanese government should pay for the atrocity that they have committed against the, you know, the, our country during World War II? And knowing that I was going to get asked a question like that. So we were, Eric and I were smart enough to go, you know, and my standard ans answer was, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm born, you know, 54. So I, I was not involved in, you know, I don't have any experience of that. And I live in Iowa. <laughs> that was my standard answer. Um, certainly you don't want to, you know, say things that, that, that certainly offend them. And, you know, I wanted to get home. So, uh, we were we were smart enough for that, and they would ask Eric. Um, I remember one point they would ask Eric uh, a question like, uh, um, uh, "United States government has dropped a, one bomb for each citizen of North Korea," and 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 don't you think? And it was the same question. Don't you think Americans should repay for the you know? the damage done to the American or the Korean citizen and and Eric had his answer and you know war is terrible you know and and uh, um, I, I can't remember what he exactly said but you know he 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 was smart enough to you know kind of fade the heat as as we say in the business and and um, so it, it, it was like that um, but getting back to the uh, so they would take us to one of the I think we went to visit Lake Dozan's house, home, where he was right, born. Right, he was actually Korean. Yeah. So we went to visit, and, you know, old home, kind of like a historical thing. And, and as I'm walking back, I feel this in the back of my head. I go, what the, you know, what the hell? I turn around. It's Muhammad Ali jabbing me in the back of my head. So, so I, so I, Champ, you want some of this? You know, then, you know, and actually there's a picture, I have it here somewhere, of me and him squaring off to Eric Bischoff, snapped off to a couple of pictures of me and me and Ali snapping, you know, getting ready to, getting ready to go. I see, you know, so me talking to some of these. And Ali was so great that, uh, that uh, when he wanted to talk, when he wanted to be cool, he was all that. He was real sharp. And I think he was sharp all the time. But when he didn't want to talk to you, you know, he was doing that so <laughs> you know he was, he was working us the, the whole time I think. worked to his benefit I guess, yeah absolutely but, and just finally on that do you do you think uh, everything's going to work out in the end with that whole north korea situation or do you think uh, it's something that we really have to be careful about well you know you know I, you know i i, I don't want to get political but um i i don't quite understand while certain country can have the bomb and other country can't and obviously yeah it's a scary thing you know J japan is the only country that ever had that bomb dropped so i'm a very sensitive to to, to destruction of, of a nuclear weapon but um you know if they already have it how do you how do you force somebody to take it down you know what I mean how do you do that and especially when you got a history of people like Gaddafi you know who who agreed to get rid of their big baseball bat of nuclear weapon you know look you know where he ended up that's probably not a good example um, so I you know I'm, I'm glad I'm not a politician that that's a hard answer um, but I, I, I know one thing though if you're a big guy like you, pick on a little guy like me, and if I only got one bullet, and that's my only bullet, you know, and I have no other way to retaliate, I think that's a scary thought, you know. 
And of course, uh, Dennis Rodman might be able to mediate that situation. Because <laughs> I guess he's friends with both Trump and the North Korean leader. Absolutely. Um, I, I think Eric and Dennis Rodman should get together and work out a coalition since they have, you know, they have a first hand. I tell you how, how great Eric was. The, the translator slash secret service lady. So all these people, I'm sure there's some kind of a ranking that they get, right? And they, they had this button, a little, little button. Um, that they all wore on their lapel. And that was a um, uh, picture of Kim Sung il and, 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 and I hope Eric still has it. Eric had, what's the word? Created a relationship the time we were there with our translator that she awarded him with that pin. Okay. And I was flabbergasted, right? I mean, you know, you know, however their education system is, you know, we're the, you know, America is a great evil and, and Japanese is probably number two on that list, you know, and Eric has convinced this lady while they were interviewing us and, you know, our, our little uh, time that we had, um, she gifted him with that pin. And only people she told us to have that pin are, you know, um, um, special citizen of, of North Korea. I actually heard Eric uh, talk, I think it was the podcast where he had you on either last year or the year before, where he was out for a run and <laughs> they were so afraid of Americans that they were literally Wait, Yeah, from... imagine, imagine, and you have to imagine this, right? So, so... Mike Chinoy of CNN was there. He was one of the only first foreign uh, reporter that got into North Korea. And and we were in our hotel lobby because that's, you know, we, we couldn't really go anywhere. So we we're kind of, that's where we always hang out. And uh, Deborah Wong of ABC News came over to our table and says, man, you, you what, I can't, professional wrestler, really? She says to us, he goes, all the time I've been trying to get into North Korea and and they have refused my you know request but I get to come here and cover professional wrestling you know she couldn't believe that she got in the country just to cover us and and that's how tight the whole thing was and and um, I think one of the first day Eric was at you know and I still he is avid runner and and uh, he didn't think anything of it. Um, I think he only got to do it once because they told us he couldn't do it anymore. You know, he put on his shorts and, and his t-shirt and uh, went out for morning run. And and we're downtown Pyongyang, you know, in the city. And what, what I found out later on and, and during a week was that these people, it doesn't matter if you worked in a factory, whatever you did, did literally march I mean, like, you come out of your house, and another guy come out of their house, and they walk, march to work. I mean, like, together, right? So by the time we got down the street, there'd be, like, you know, a dozen of people, and they all, you know, their suit might not be, have a hole in the elbow, but they're all wearing, and they might have been doing it for us. I don't know. But they were, you know, very uniform, and they were, you know, um, very formal, and imagine you're going to work and you you basically been propaganda and, and all the news that the evil, you know, Westerners, suddenly the number one enemy being American, and uh, you're walking probably all your life and you see this guy running towards you. <laughs> Eric said people parted like he was he was Moses. 